Going live. Uh, hello everyone at home, welcome back to the Cambridge Festival, welcome back to Cambridge University Astronomy. Um, hope everyone at home is having a good Easter weekend and I hope you've been enjoying the wonderful Cambridge Festival videos that we've been putting out on this channel. We've had a really fantastic week of uh, fascinating, uh, fascinating content, just all kinds of amazing things from black holes to galaxy cakes to physics in your kitchen. And today we have something yeah, different still. So I'm here with Mark Hearn, who is the librarian at the Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge University. And he's gonna be telling us all about the historical telescopes that we have in the department. Um, so I'm very excited for this one. So uh, over to you, Mark. Okay, thanks, Matt. And happy Easter, everybody. Um, we're coming a bit closer to home now with talking about Cambridge rather than the deep reaches of space. As Matt said, um, I'm lucky enough to look after the library at the Institute of Astronomy in Cambridge. The Institute itself was founded by the cosmologist Fred Hoyle back in 1967, but it also includes the historic Cambridge Observer Observatory, which is much older. And uh, we are located, this is our site, on the west side of Cambridge, um, along the Maddingley Road. And uh, the main observatory building, which I'll be talking about, is shown by a arrow on this uh, screen. And this is what it looked like when it was new, uh, back in 1823. Uh, before this time, there were a few observatories in some of the colleges in Cambridge, but these were mainly converted towers or gatehouses. Um, this building you can see here was the first purpose designed observatory for Cambridge. And as well as telescopes, the building was a house for the Plumian Professor of Astronomy and his assistant. The picture shows the east end of the building, which itself runs precisely east to west and faces the south. Now, the original complement of telescopes that went into that uh, lovely building um, is listed here. They were mostly fitted inside the building itself. And you might note that the dates of the telescopes are all slightly later than 1823 and the reason for this was that uh, a lot of money was spent on the building itself and not much was left over for buying telescopes so most of the telescopes came much later and this shows you how the telescopes were set up inside the building um, this is what is called the transit room, and the photographs date from the 1890s. The telescope shown is an 8-inch diameter Cook telescope of 1870. On the left, the observer is Andrew Graham, who was assistant at the observatory from 1864 to 1902. And on the right, the observer is Sir Robert Ball, who was actually director of the observatory from 1892 to 1913. Sadly, uh, this telescope uh, was broken up and removed from the building back in the 1960s. Um, this exterior view shows um, the sort of general arrangement whereby the telescopes were set up in rooms inside the building and they would look out through slits provided in the sides and roof of the building, uh, marked by arrows here. And there were wooden shutters to keep out the wind and the rain uh, when the telescopes were not being used. This is the building, how it looks today. Um, you can see there's a bit of a rainbow in that photo. Um, it's now mainly offices and houses the library of the uh, uh, Institute. There aren't any telescopes in this building today. The next major development on the site 
was the Northumberland Telescope, located a little bit to the southwest of the observatory building. And this picture here shows the uh, building housing the Northumberland Telescope. It was set up about 1838. Um, originally it had a wooden dome. Um, this is a replacement dome uh, which was uh, put in in the 1930s after the wooden one had sort of uh, become too dilapidated uh, to, to work anymore. And this is the data on uh, the Northumberland telescope, which still exists in that building. It's a, an 11 and a half inch uh, refractor. That's the traditional style telescope, uh, which uh, you might see sailors or pirates using. Uh, it has an eye end uh, where you look through and a big lump of glass at the other end, which collects the light. It was uh, completed in 1838 and it was designed by uh, one of the early directors of the Cambridge Observatory, uh, George Biddle Airy. And the object glass, that's that big lump of glass, was by Couchois of Paris. And at the, at the time that it was installed in 1838, it was one of the largest refracting telescopes in the world. Uh, not the largest, but one of the largest. And here are some pictures of the telescope itself. Um, you can see the eye end there uh, with the um, knob used to um, alter the, uh, the focus and also the smaller finding telescope. And also on the right, you can see how the telescope um, is mounted in a uh, kind of uh, yoke type mount known as the English mounting, um, which is actually all constructed out of wood. Unfortunately, the Northumberland telescope um, is really famous for what it didn't discover. Um, and that was the uh, planet Neptune. It was used in a, an unsuccessful hunt for the planet Neptune back in 1846. And um, the story goes that um, in the 1840s, there was uh, some speculation about a, a planet more distant than Uranus. Uranus had been discovered by William Herschel from his back garden in Bath in 1781, um, but astronomers thought there could well be other planets that may be discovered further out in the solar system. And uh, by the 1840s, um, they were ready to start looking. And um, the Northumberland telescope was used in a, a, a search for um, the undiscovered planet. It may even have seen it but um, the observers weren't uh, conscious of it. And unfortunately, they were pipped at the post by the Berlin Observatory, which did discover the planet Neptune based on mathematical calculations by a French astronomer called Erval Le Verrier. So um, unfortunately, um, the Northumberland missed out on what might have been one of the greatest uh, astronomical discoveries of the 19th century. It's still used um, um, today mainly for public observing nights and by the University Astronomy Society. Um, here's a picture of uh, George Airy, um, the designer of the Northumberland Telescope. Um, he went on to become Astronomer Royal in charge of the Greenwich Observatory uh, for a large chunk of the 19th century. And, uh, he was a, a very eminent uh, scientist um, who advised the government on a, a lot of uh, important projects. Uh, this is an old illustration of the Northumberland showing that wooden dome that I mentioned previously. Uh, it wasn't a, a hemispherical dome, but had more of a sort of cone type shape. Um, during the hunt for Neptune, um, the director of the observatory was the Reverend James Chalice, who was the Plumian professor as well. 
and um, the um, search from Cambridge was based on mathematical calculations by John Cooch Adams, who later himself um, became a director of the Cambridge Observatory. Um, unfortunately, all these telescopes uh, require a lot of maintenance. Uh, as you can see here, um, the uh, brickwork of the um, Northumberland building um, got into a rather sorry state and had to be repaired a few years back. Um, also, that um, metal dome had proved uh, too heavy for the structure and a, a lighter copper dome um, now exists uh, on the building. And, and there's a picture of it when it was, was um, just fitted. Um, it's not so shiny and, uh, uh, and golden now. This shows a, a, a telescope which um, no longer exists on the site, but behind it you can see a, a photograph of the original uh, Northumberland dome. But this telescope is the Newell telescope, uh, which really was the largest telescope uh, of its sort, uh, of its time. Um, this photo dates to about 1900. And the Newell Telescope uh, was commissioned by a wealthy uh, businessman called R.S. Newell. Uh, and he lived um, in um, Tyneside and uh, he'd earned a lot of money uh, providing cables to the uh, transatlantic telegraphs. And this shows the telescope uh, in his garden at Ferndean. And uh, you can see it's a refractor. It was built by the firm of Cook. And um, it was used in its early days for some sketches by quite a famous artist of, uh, in this case, a, a crater, but also of sunspots, uh, Henry Holiday, who was one of the pre-Raphaelite artists actually used the telescope to produce some sketches. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Newell telescope was built by Thomas Cook of York. Um, building the telescope was a tremendous uh, challenge and it's thought that um, it um, caused um, the uh, telescope maker Thomas Cook um, ill health and uh, might have led to his early death. Um, when R.S. Newell himself died, the telescope was moved to Cambridge uh, back in 1891. Subsequently, after the Second World War, um, the telescope was offered to uh, any other observatory that would take it. And it, it now exists in Athens, where it, it uh, lives in a fantastic purpose designed uh, dome and is used for a wide range of uh, public uh, viewing uh, activities. But for a short time, this telescope was the largest of its sort. Um, it was a 25 inch diameter refractor. Um, the site of the Newell telescope is, is now um, taken up by the Cavalier Institute for Cosmology, Cambridge. So in a sense, um, the site is still being used for re research in astronomy, even if not um, strictly um, observing. Um, this little wooden hut here um, houses another interesting historic telescope. It uh, is the Thorogood telescope. And it's another refractor, in this case, uh, an eight inch diameter objective. Uh, the telescope itself was built by Thomas Cook of York in 1864 and there's a view of the eye end of the telescope. Um, it's in a very complete condition. Um, in the background you can see a rope used for moving the roof of the dome. It had an interesting series of uh, owners there's some data on it here. Uh, it still has its original clock drive. 
and it's mounted on what is known as a German equatorial mount. As I mentioned, uh, it had an interesting series of private owners before it came to Cambridge. Um, the first being the, Will the Reverend William Rutter Dawes, um, a famous um, observer of the planet Mars. Um, it was also used by a series of uh, double star observers, including George Hunt and William Henry Moore, um, before it was purchased by a railway engineer called William Thorogood. Now, Thorogood uh, left his telescope uh, to the Royal Astronomical Society on his death in 1928. And the Royal Astronomical Society, being based in London, had nowhere for it to go. So the, current, the then director of the observatory, who was Sir Arthur Eddington, offered to take it for Cambridge. And it's been on our site ever since although it still technically belongs to the Royal Astronomical Society. Here's a picture of the first owner at the William, William Rutter Dawes or eagle-eyed Rutter Dawes, as he was known to his astronomical friends. Uh, he had it at his private observatory in uh, Buckinghamshire. And um, at the time, it was worth about 580 pounds. And you can see his uh, estate when he died, that it represented a, a considerable uh, percentage of his, his private wealth. Um, he used it mainly for studies of Mars, but also of um, craters on the moon, including the crater Linne, uh, which at the time was thought to be exhibiting um, some changes, uh, which, uh, probably was just imaginary. Uh, George Hunt uh, was a, a, the next owner of the telescope. Um, he um, started work on double stars um, using this telescope, uh, which was continued by the consulting engineer, uh, William Henry Moore. As you can see, he was a considerably wealthy man and the telescope only represented a small percentage of his total wealth. He had an observatory, a private observatory on his estate in Outwood, Surrey. So the telescope has moved around the country quite a bit. Um, here's um, William Thorogood, the final owner after which the telescope is named. He was a uh, railway signaling engineer uh, he didn't really do much uh, work in astronomy and um, he uh, left both this telescope and a smaller telescope um, to astronomical bodies such as the Royal Astronomical Society and the British Astronomical Association. So he was more of a, uh, a philanthropist um, than an actual astronomer. Um, this shows the eye end of the Thorogood telescope with a um, micrometer fitted for measuring double stars, uh, work, work which does continue with the telescope um, by one of my colleagues, uh, Bob Argyle, who's done a lot of uh, double star observations using it. So it's quite a continuity of use. Um, this telescope is uh, available to um, look at the sun as well um, very carefully using eyepiece projection. Um, this shows um, it being used uh, for the transit of Venus, which occurred on the 8th of June, 2004. This is some of my colleagues uh, enjoying the view. And that shows the planet Venus moving in front of the disk of the sun uh, on a, a wonderful uh, sunny uh, morning uh, where um, I think a few hundred people visited the observatory to watch uh, um, what, what is a, a very rare event. As I mentioned, the Thorogood has a continuity of use in double star work, um, which has continued uh, for uh, well over 100, use, 100 years. Um, Unfortunately, we are having technical problems with the dome on this telescope. Um, it uh, is 
proving very difficult to move at the moment and so some engineering work is required to get the telescope back into use. This slide shows the what we call the Solar Physics Observatory which moved to our site in from London in 1914 and uh, the dome which you can see on the right um, is called the Huggins Dome and it, it housed uh, a telescope um, which belonged to Sir William Huggins but sadly the, the telescope was broken up in the 1950s. Um, they then fitted a Schmidt camera which is a special kind of photographic survey um, telescope uh, which you can see pictured here. Um, that itself um, was replaced and uh, it was uh, removed to the Space Guard Centre in uh, Wales uh, where it's set up to detect uh, near-Earth asteroids as part of the Space Guard project. And um, you can see the um, mount of that uh, Schmidt camera being very delicately removed out of the Huggins Dome here for shipment to uh, Wales um, in 2009. Um, at Space Guard, it was fitted with a CCD detector, uh, so it, it, it can continue to be used. The um, 36 inch dome is at the south end of our site and it houses perhaps one of the largest telescopes in Britain today, the uh, largest optical telescopes. It's a 36 inch reflecting telescope uh, built by Grubb Parsons back in the 1950s and it was fitted with a radial velocity spectrometer and used extensively by um, the late Professor Roger Griffin who used it for a series of uh, studies of the radial velocities of stars and was really perhaps the last active professional observer uh, on, uh, you know, on the Cambridge Observatory site. Uh, sadly he died earlier this year uh, but had stopped observing um, uh, maybe about two years ago. So um, that really concludes my um, short uh, uh, excursion around the uh, Cambridge Observatory looking at some of its historical telescopes. Um, I am thankful for some of the people here for help uh, researching the history of the telescopes and providing slides. So um, if anyone's interested, I'm uh, more than happy to uh, answer any questions anyone might have. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's, uh, thank you so much, Mark. It's absolutely fascinating hearing the history of these telescopes that we have on site. I mean, it's one of the reasons I feel very lucky to work in this department. You get all this history right under your feet. Uh, it's, it really is wonderful. Um, so yeah, so for anyone that has a question for our speaker, um, you can pop them down there in the YouTube chat. Um, the first question I've seen has come through on Twitter. Um, so if someone wants to know about astronomical research, so presumably in the past, these telescopes would have been used for like science research. Like do we do, we do science research on the site still? Um, not really. Um, Cambridge isn't a terribly good place to set up optical telescopes. We're very near sea level and we also um, have over the years become surrounded by buildings and lights and so on. So um, our site is no longer a good place to site professional telescopes. So the astronomers at the Institute use telescopes mostly on high mountain tops in places like Chile um, and also use data from space telescopes. So um, really the telescopes which remain on our site are of historical interest, but they still provide rather beautiful views of things like uh, the um, moons of Jupiter or the rings of Saturn, craters on the moon and uh, lovely nebula and, and so on. 
So um, they, they still play a role in our, our public outreach program. Um, absolutely, yes. Um, so we have a question through from Cormac, um, who wants to know um, if it would be possible to get a telescope in the dome of the observatory, because obviously the observatory building has that lovely dome at the top. Um, like yeah. How feasible would it be to have a telescope there these days? That's right. Um, we've often had that idea ourselves over the years, but there are a number of major technical problems um, using uh, that dome. Um, the first is that um, because it's a listed building and um, it is not adapted for disabled access, we would have problems um, using it for public outreach work, which is really what we would want to use it for. Um, the other technical problem is that the, the dome was originally designed for a, a, quite a small refractor. And so the slit in the dome is only um, about a foot wide, you know, about 30 centimetres. And so that would restrict the type of telescope that we could put in there. Um, it's also... <laughs> Um, lets in the, the wind and the rain quite a bit as well. So there, there's, there's quite a few sort of technical issues to get over before we could use that dome. Yeah, no, I mean, you're completely right. It's a shame. I think it'd be, the, the, I, there'd be something quite romantic, I think, about going up to that dome and, and doing some stargazing from the top. But yeah, you're right. It would need quite a lot of work uh, before it was feasible. Um, one last question I've seen come through on Twitter from Charlie, who's nine, who wants to know what your favourite, what's your favourite telescope uh, at the observatory? Um, I think it has to be the Northumberland telescope. It's so big, um, people just go wow when they go through the door. And uh, it provides such beautiful views of, like I say, um, the planets and the moon. And also... Um, it's just so lovely when, when you place it onto an object in the sky, the way it stays there and it's so steady and uh, it, it is just a delightful telescope to use. So it has to be the Northumberland. Um, absolutely. So we have a question, a question through from Jim. Um, are the telescopes at the, on the, at the observatory able to view the north uh, or are they, are they only able to see things across the ecliptic? That's a really good question and, and very astute. Yeah, I mean, traditionally observatories like ours were set up mainly to view the southern uh, view of the sky, uh, where most of the sort of astronomical activity of planets um, would be going on. However, um, it's not impossible to use our telescopes on the northern sky, and occasionally we do so, um, particularly when uh, comets come at us uh, through uh, odd uh, directions and uh, you need to turn the telescopes right to the north. Um, it, it's not easy, but even the Northumberland, you can set it up um, to look north. Um, the, the main obstacle really are the trees on the site. <laughs> We've got lots of lovely trees which get in the way, um, but uh, no, you, it's a good point, and uh, we, we can view the northern skies. Yeah, I've, I've definitely been observing in some of the telescopes on the site before where, uh, the, where there is something just below the tree line. And I mean, so the, tree, the trees are very good for blocking light, right? So they're quite good that they're there, but they, they can become a bit of an obstruction. Um, That's question, right. Question through from uh, Gapreet, uh, who wants to know what's the newest of the telescopes that you've mentioned? What's the newest telescope we have on site? Right. Well, um, we do actually have a modern go-to telescope um, set up in our Huggins Dome, um, which is a, a modern sort of uh, Schmidt type telescope, um, which can be computer controlled. And that's mainly used uh, for our public observing and also for sort of training for um, our young astronomers to, to learn how to use a, a more modern telescope. Uh, so um, we, we do have, you know, a, a more up-to-date telescope on our site, um, but it is mainly old things, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, I guess they both have their advantages and disadvantages. I mean, so the the old telescopes are absolutely beautiful, but sometimes it's quite nice to be able to just press go to right in the telescope, automatically slew to a part in the sky that you want to see. That's right. Um, wonderful. Well, it looks like there's no more questions. Um, so I uh, thank you so much again, Mark. Um, I think I've said before, it's one of these strange things about doing talks online that you don't get to, you don't get to get the round of applause afterwards. So you'll have to imagine a, a round of virtual applause. <laughs> That's all right. Um, no, I, I'm really pleased. And there were some really good questions there. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. It's really wonderful to hear about uh, the things that we have on site. Um, so, yeah, so that's it for today. So for everyone watching at home, we are near the end of our Cambridge Festival programme. Um, all the events that we've had so far are still to view on our YouTube channel. So if you've enjoyed this, you can check out our other videos. And we will be back tomorrow at 3 p.m. with our final talk of the festival. We're going to have a talk about decolonialising science from Dr. Chandrima Ganguly from the Department of Mathematics. Um, so until then, I, we will see you tomorrow. Okay, bye. And we're done.